Hello fellow adventurers and welcome to the Nerd Lab, where we transform our gaming passion into incredible game designs and learn how to nerd like a boss. My name is Marvin and I'm an ambitious game designer on my quest to develop a strategy card game. For this podcast, my vision is to take you with me on this exciting journey. Together we will explore the secrets of different game mechanics and reach the next level as a game designer. Today, we really have some very special guests on the NerdLab podcast. Namely, the designer team, the entire designer team of um, our game Mindbug. Um, this includes Christian Kudal. Hi, Christian. Hi. This includes Richard Garfield. Hi, Richard. Hi. This also includes Skeff Elias. Hi, Skeff. Hello. And myself, Marvin Hegen. Um, and last but not least, the creature that commands all of our brains and probably brought all of us together. The mind bug. You can see it over here. It's in the back. Um, all and so, hail the mind bug. Yeah, all hail the mind bug. And so even so, all of you probably are not here on your free own will today. I really, I'm really, really happy to, 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 to have brought all of you together for this show today um, because I think it's an incredible opportunity to show our audience um, a little bit of behind the scene um, mind bug development and um, yeah, talk a little bit about how the game came to be, what we all like about it and um, yeah, just have some kind of casual conversation about it. I love that. So um, let's start with a short Pretty short introduction round. Um, Christian, do you want to go first? Yes, sure. Hi, I'm Christian. Uh, I'm from Denmark. I've uh, been designing games for a few years, and this is the first game which is coming out, which I'm super excited about. Thank you. Richard, Will you want, uh, do you want to go first? The next. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, Richard Garfield, uh, uh, best known for designing uh, Magic the Gathering, and uh, um, and uh, I'm excited to be able to lend some expertise to uh, to Mindbug. Thank you, Scaff. What about you? Hi, uh, hi. I'm uh, Scaff Elias. I've um, worked with Richard for many years uh, on Magic and um, and also like on the organized play system around it. Um, awesome. It's great to have you on board as well um, for today's session. So. Um, even so, you are not. Uh, uh, you cannot be seen on the on the video because um, the video didn't work out. Uh, we still have you on the on the audio channel, which is uh, which is awesome as well. Yes, I, I apologize for that. Although your viewers might be thankful. Yeah, you. that's the better half. <laughs> <laughs> and I have actually never seen you, Skeff. So I'm totally with the viewers. Me neither. So. We have to we have to change this in the future. So as you can probably uh, probably uh, um, figure out already, we typically um, meet without video, so just audio. But we thought it might be a good uh, good idea to to turn on our video cameras today. Um, um, if we, we want to use this uh, kind of material um, for video for video um, coverage as well. So um, I think in the beginning we should we should briefly tell the people how everything started and um, since it started with uh, mainly with, with with you Christian um, maybe it's a good idea if you can briefly explain what our core vision of the game was in the very beginning sure um, I, I, I'm not sure if we had the same one but uh, I'll go anyway I'm not sure so, if, we, uh, if, if we have the same one right now <laughs> so I uh, I was a hopeful young uh, game designer uh, still am and listening to uh, Marvin's podcast to uh, hear all the, these experienced designers talk about game design. And uh, I, of course, wanted to, to try it out. Um, so what I initially thought was uh, I like two-player games. It's uh, I think it's kind of easier to design two-player games. So in multiplayer games, you have you can have stuff like king-making or alliances, which is, I think, tricky to design for. Or um, if you want to avoid it, you sometimes get very low into action. So I figured two players is a nice, easy place to start. Whatever the people do will help them hurt the other one. It's just kind of the same thing. Um, I come from kind of the, the abstract games community. I played a lot of uh, abstracts, which are people like really simple rules and strategy. So I, I kind of like the minimalistic approach. So I um, 
But I also like cool card games like uh, Magic and Hearthstone, which where you have all these cards with cool effects on them. So I wanted to do something like that, but with very simple effects. Um, so I I didn't want players to have to learn a lot of complicated concepts or understand cards with the many paragraphs of text. Um, so some kind of simple text would be cool. Um, some uh, Something with fast playing time and fast turns would be nice. Um, I would like if it was still strategic. So it's, uh, you, want, you know, you want something very short, but, and very skill based, but also with some fun swings with the cards. Uh, and I figured since I was pretty new at this, I was not very good at designing cards. Um, but I had this idea that there were systems that could help you a bit so that you could get away with a bit less balanced cards. For example, I knew drafting games where you draft the cards, you can so- somehow get away with uh, not all cards being exactly equally good. Um, so I wanted some kind of system where you can come up with all the cool, crazy cards you want, um, and you can just shuffle them all up and deal some to each player, and you will have a fun and uh, fair game. Um, which sounds pretty hard to do, actually, now that I'm saying it out loud. Um, uh, so, so the system... Um, uh, the the system was uh, the idea was okay, so kind of like drafting. If if your opponent gets all the good cards, you want to be able to get some of them somehow. So the idea was um, when you when your opponent plays a card, sometimes you are able to steal that card and it will work for you instead. Um, in the beginning, we used diamonds for it, so it said each player has two diamonds, and when the opponent plays a card, you can spend a diamond to take that card. Um, and by some luck or happenstance, it turned out to work pretty well. Um, <laughs> so it, it gives a good balance, and I think you can just think of that game, think of giving each player a hand of numbered cards, and you're trying to uh, get to 21st or get the highest uh, total or something like this. Already playing this game um, with this diamond system is it's a little bit interesting. So you can like play your biggest card early, hope it doesn't get stolen, or... Um, there are some nice choices. So this was the starting idea. Uh, so I talked to, to Marvin because uh, I felt we had a similar taste in games and we, we started working on this together. Um, I think we were pretty lucky already from the start. The game was working well and was, was pretty fun. Um, well, do you agree with that, Marvin? <laughs> Yeah, to, to not with everything. I think you undersold yourself uh, when you talked about you're pretty bad at uh, at creating cards. I I, I would uh, I would say you're pretty good at creating cards, um, but um, I totally agree with how everything started and um, that the core idea was to um, to create a strategic game. For me, it was always I wanted to have the strate- to keep the strategic depth of. Um, of all the strategy card games I love, like Magic, Hearthstone, um, Keyforge, and all the others, um, but I wanted to make it to make it simpler. I wanted to um, to reduce complexity and get rid of some of the flaws that these games that these games have. So um, it's pretty hard for me to play Magic with my spouse, for example, with my wife, um, because it has a very high barrier to uh, entry barrier. So this was one of the things that I was considering. Um, in the beginning and also um sometimes when when i played uh, ma- magic for example against someone else it felt kind of unfair because that person uh, was mana screwed or mana flooded and did, it didn't really ended up in a, in a in a real game so there were some kind of of flaws in these games um that i really nevertheless really loved um and i my goal was to to really bring some kind of the simplicity of these let's call them standard card games um into um into into the world of strategy card games and yeah i think what we ended up with is uh, is a game that really for me it feels like a like like a, a full blown trading card strategy card game um but in a single box so that's pretty much um what what i what i what i um, always had in mind for it so that explains it quite well so um if we um maybe we can spend 
just a few minutes to talk about the rules of the game to give the people a very rough high level understanding um, of the game so mindbug comes with um, as a as a 52 card deck um, of which um, four cards are the so-called mind bugs um, that's what Christian mentioned as the former um, as the former um, diamonds, the diamonds. <laughs> they say they somehow transformed into mind bugs um, and um, the, uh, um, the the remaining 48 cards are creature cards um, and that's also something that the game um, really um, what makes the game a little bit different to to these other strategy card games out there um, because we only have one card type that's um, that's an underlying um, let's say theme that you will see that we um, reduce complexity wherever possible without losing the depth so we reduced um, the from the classical perspective we reduced it to one one creature at uh, one card type, namely creatures. Um, we reduced, um, we, we, or we get, got rid completely of um, the um, resources. So there are no mana costs or crystals needed to play cards. And there is no power value and toughness and let's say quickness and so many different other uh, attributes that you could think of. Our creatures only have one value. They only have a power value. And that makes um, our cards and creatures... Um, relatively simple to understand in the beginning but nevertheless we all all of us really love the idea of having um, um, spell-like effects so we said okay our creatures should all have or most of them should have some kind of crazy spell-like effects so uh, when you play a creature or when you uh, it can it can trigger an effect or when you attack with a creature it can trigger an effect or when a creature uh, um, is defeated that can also trigger an effect um, and that will feel like a spell in all of these other games um, but it made it made it much easier for us to to work on the cards and on the rules to to, to just keep it as one card type um, and how the game works is that you um, you play from one deck so there is no deck construction that's also something we got rid of um initially and um each player draws 10 cards five of them to their hand and five of them as an um, as a draw pile next to them on the on the table and um yeah each turn um a player can has has two options either um they can play um, a creature card from their hand exactly one without any resource costs or they can attack with exactly one creature that they already have on the battlefield um, so um, that means um, when you and when you attack with with one of one of your creatures, um, your opponent got the the chance to block to throw one uh, one of their creatures in the way, and then you you um, just simply compare the power values of the two different creatures, and the the higher power valued creature wins, and the other one is defeated and goes uh, to the discard pile. The goal of the game is to reduce the life point, um, life points of your opponent to zero. And so when you attack and the, your opponent doesn't uh, doesn't block or is not able to block, they lose a life, and they always lose exactly one life, no matter how much power your creature um, has. Um, that is pretty much the game in a nutshell, and that sounds. So when I when I hear that explanation, I always think, okay, that sounds like a bit of generic stuff of strategy card games that I have seen before. Um, but here comes the twist. The twist really is the mind bug mechanic. So when you, um, whenever you play a card, your opponent gets immediately the chance to use one of their mind bugs to, um, to steal the card, to mind control your creature. And that means your creature will enter the battlefield on their side and not on yours. And when this happens, you get another action and can play another creature. But um, what this really does is it adds some kind of pacing to the game because you um, you cannot just play your strongest card. You could. I mean, you could. There is no resource cost. Um, you can play your strongest card in the first turn, but then you might run into the problem that your opponent steals it and <laughs> you lose against your own card. And that creates these kind of mind games and strategic thinking where you need to, need to think several turns ahead um, how you want to to build some kind of strategy? What cards are really important for your strategy? Um, can you can you answer the the creatures if the opponent uh, mind controls it and stuff like that? So this is pretty much um, how the game how the game is is played. We have of course a lot of um, very crazy powerful effects and um, 
and keywords and stuff like that that will um, spice everything up. But um, in a nutshell, that is how the game works. Okay, can I just add one thing to that? Yeah, of so, course. So a consequence of these rules is if you have a creature with the big power, like a power 10, it's the biggest one, it means that you can attack with that each turn and you can also use it to defend yourself, um, which is normally uh, in such a game, uh, I mean, for example, in Magic, when you attack with a creature, you tap it and then they cannot defend, which I think is actually pretty smart um, because it means you have kind of an interesting dilemma. So here, one thing I was terrified of in the beginning was this big numbers dominating everything. So if you have a 10 power creature, the opponent can only attack with one creature each turn. So you can just block that. You can attack every turn. So it kind of sounds like it's not going to work. <laughs> so what I think what really makes this word is um, the the keywords and the abilities on the cards, um, which e sort of easily counter these big values. So the big values are definitely not the most powerful cards. But from hearing the rules, you would actually expect them to to dominate the board quite often. Yeah. And that's actually um, also, maybe that transitions a little bit into when Richard and Skeff joined our team. Because, um, I mean, Richard, you, you have been a guest on the Nerd Lab podcast. And um, I think after the show, I think one of your advice to, to new designers was to play a lot of games, just to, to, to learn from playing other games. So um, I asked you, hey, Richard, uh, don't you want to just play test uh, or play our game? Um, I didn't expect that you would learn something from it, but um, I, was, yeah. I was keen on getting your, on getting your feedback. Um, and I think when I remember correctly, my pitch was something like, um, yeah, we created this, this kind of game that is... Uh, that has an auto-balancing mechanic that allows us um, to create these crazy powerful cards without breaking the game, uh, making each card very interesting. And um, um, we can do that even without some kind of resource system. Um, and can you, can you remember what, your, what, was your, what was your response to that? No, I, I don't. Uh, uh, I, 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 remember... I can. Oh, yeah, I okay. Can. Your, your, your response was... That must be an overstatement. <laughs> and okay. uh, but I, th but I think I at least got your interest in it. So uh, you, you, it probably is an overstatement. <laughs> yeah, it probably was an overstatement. Okay, I, I, I confess it probably was an overstatement. Um, but um, at least I got your interest to um, to play around with uh, with with me. Um, and so we found ourselves um, in Tabletop Simulator playing um, playing around of. Um, of the game, so maybe you can um, you can tell us a little bit about how that first game really felt for you and uh, what you what you liked about the game that made you um, yeah made you join the team. Well, uh, yeah, I was immediately intrigued by the idea that you could uh, steal uh, two cards from your opponent each game, um, and uh, um, it I think it took me a while to accept that as a method of balance. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not even sure that, that I'd yet qualify it that way. Uh, just because, uh, um, well, uh, I won't go into uh, uh, um, what, wh why, why that might, uh, might seem incorrect to me, but, uh, but regardless of whether it's used to balance the game or not, the idea of playing a card knowing your opponent can take it from you seemed very interesting. And the idea of having this uh, two-shot resource to take a card from your opponent when they play it and when to use it also seemed interesting. Um, and then uh, um, the when we sat down to play, uh, uh, I was really happy to see how simple the rest of the game was. Uh, um, in particular, there were a few other things that stood out to me. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know what you call them, uh, uh, fighting card games where, uh, uh, where um, you're, you, you've got a deck and you're drawing from the deck and you're playing cards and you're trying to defeat your opponent. Uh, but you all were beginning with this premise that you had this very small number of cards that you were dealing with every game. Uh, so, so in particular, each person had 10 cards. Um, 
and uh, and you didn't know what those ten cards were at the beginning, uh, and and uh, and and you would play through knowing that was all you got, uh, except possibly the two you would steal from your uh, opponent. Um, and uh, managing that tight set of resources uh, uh, was also quite fun. Um, and uh, uh, and the simplicity of the uh, creature, uh, the, the way the creatures work, um, seemed like the smallest set of rules that you could hang a game like this on uh, and uh, get it to work. And so, uh, which is to say, uh, each turn you can play a creature or you can attack with a creature, and that's it, right? And, uh, uh, really, I think uh, the, the, the you know the game rules uh, certainly uh, for purposes of reminding somebody how to play could easily fit on a three by five card. It's uh, super simple, um, and yet you'd get a lot of depth out of this uh, these decisions. And uh, and yeah, so so uh, uh, I, I I was uh, really uh, interested to see where where this game would go and. Uh, and uh, and what else you could do with it? Because uh, you know already there was a huge variety in the cards that were available, and uh, uh, the situation seemed to uh, be uh, perpetually interesting. It was very very uh, tight design. I guess it's a it could be a bit of a worry with such a like a minimalistic rule set where you can't do a lot of stuff. Is if there's really enough um, design space to keep coming up with a bunch of interesting cards. Um, yeah, it's sort of that's a, one of the things you look for in these in in, in these mo, um, massively modular games, as I, I like to call them, where uh, uh, you want uh, the rules to be as simple as possible, but to be able to hang as much variety on as possible, and you want to make it so that the uh, that the rules are easy to understand, but the consequences are not obvious. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, this this. Uh, and and it's it's always uh, surprising how much you can get out of a out of a, a, a robust simple system. Um, I mean, uh, going back to to, to magic, uh, 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 we uh, we sort of felt like the the game was going to run out of simple space, uh, uh, but which of course logically it has to. Uh, but it just you know took a lot longer than we expected, uh, and uh, and it's uh, still going pretty strong, I guess. Yeah. And early on, uh, I, I began advocating the idea that you didn't want to be in the business of selling cards; you wanted to be selling uh, environments because you could make environments effectively forever. But but cards, you might run out. But turns out, you know, cards effectively are not going to run out either. So you can do it either way. In any case, uh, segue. Uh, 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 that's a, uh, what you've got here was a system that was a, a simple and modular and uh, combinatoric, and uh, you had already done a lot with it. It was clear you could do a lot more. Yeah, and I think um, the both of you really helped us to do a lot, a lot more. So um, um, I will come to that back later in a second or so. Uh, but Scaf, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, yeah what your first impressions with the game were when when you when you played it for the first time. Uh, well, I was heavily influenced by the fact that Richard already told me it was a good game. So I didn't have a choice as to what I was going to feel uh, the first time I played it. Um, so if Richard says uh, it's an interesting game, then then it may not be a good game, but it's definitely interesting in some way. He, he sees something there. So, you know, most of the time it's a good game, but not always. So there was a little bit of, uh, of, of, of suspense But no, it, 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 it was excellent. It was everything kind of that Richard had billed it as being. It, it was very, um, it, the thing I like about it is there's very few, you know, decisions in the game uh, and they're all important, like every single one. And, and be, because it, it's sort of been stripped down with normal trading card games, you play on autopilot a lot and i i'm basically never do that in mindbug you know um you, you it's it's extremely rare that you're on an autopilot decision and so that's pretty cool i mean i really enjoyed that and i do really think that the the mindbug innovation in particular is brilliant because it's more like 
it's more like a combination of a draft and a card game all mixed into one, you know, uh, but still playing very quickly is, I, I guess, the closest, you know, that it would be uh, for someone that's played normal TCG. Yeah, it's kind of like you're drafting a bit while you're playing. <clears throat> right. And uh, and bluffing people. There's a lot of bluffing in the game, um, which is, again, I think unusual for trading card games. Uh, a lot of times people think they're bluffing, but since the proper play, you know, 90% of the time in Magic is just called bluff, uh, while there is bluffing in Magic, it's, there's less than it seems. And, and here it, it is quite a bit different. I mean, I think you, you really, um, there's a little bit more uh, going on relative to the number of decisions you're making. Um, so yeah, so my first impression was great. And I also love the simplicity. I certainly would never worry about running out of space, creating cards. I never believed that that would happen with pretty much any TCG I've ever worked on, you know, uh, magic included, as Richard said, the, at, at worst, you, you would have to change the, uh, the environments. As soon as you have that tool, you're, you're pretty much set, um, set for life. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think I think the simplicity means you can do a lot. So when you guys talk about environment and magic, do you mean like the setting, like the thematic setting? You basically, I mean, uh, originally, you know, it was the thematic sets, um, like Ice Age, uh, you know, was uh, essentially designed before magic actually even came out into the regular world. And the idea was you could play inside these different settings. So you know, one setting, you don't have to change um, really a lot. Uh, maybe there's almost no creatures or lots of creatures or big creatures or whatever. That's like the simplest thing you can adjust. And um, and, it, and the game plays completely differently and you can just create a completely different set of cards. Um, and so and it's the same thing with, um, uh, you know, going forward in Magic. Uh, essentially, people have decided to mix, you know, the last whatever two years worth of sets for standard play or more than that various you know uh extensions beyond um beyond the standard format but yeah just constantly rotating what's in and out so and i and you can do the same thing with mind bug obviously too yeah so um there's one one situation that i remember when we played i don't know it was maybe the the second or third session or so that we had playing the game um and um i think i played um it was me playing against you richard and uh, what you did after our first game you just copied the deck i think 16 times um so yeah. all, all the cards that we that we had created so we create individual cards all of them unique and you copied them 16 times so we had a deck of i don't know a few hundred cards at least um and you said let's play from that that pile And um, I was <laughs> I was a bit confused. So oh my god, what, he, what what what's he doing? I don't know why he's doing that. Um, and then we played it, and I started to have we started to have um, uh, duplicates in the set. Um, and um, I I was kind of um, skeptical in the beginning, to be honest, um, having these duplicates because our main idea was in the beginning every card is unique and super super um, powerful, and you see it only once. And then we played it and. I think it has immediately made the game better by just copying the the the, the pool several times, um, and I thought, oh my god, this is this is just a genius! He just copied the deck and made it <laughs> and made it better. So maybe you can uh, you can tell us a little bit um, what what um, yeah what was your idea by um, just copying the the, the the deck multiple times and having duplicates in the or multiple multiple um, copies of each card in the in the set. Well, I mean, uh, when, when, when I was first doing it, uh, it, it was uh, basically I, I, I was just wanted to see what it felt like when the environment was uh, had uh, duplicated cards floating around. Because oftentimes when you have duplicated cards, they uh, become more interesting. Like if you've got only one card in the game where you play it and your opponent loses a life, Uh, in direct damage, uh, then you can sort of play around that card. But if there's two in it, two in the environment, it sort of changes the the whole uh, uh, flavor of that. And and so it's very common that uh, that a particular card will work well with itself. Now, not all will. Some will work 
more poorly with copies of themselves or be less interesting or uh and so forth but uh but uh um but uh yeah i wanted to see what uh you know where this ended up if we did that um also uh if you from a designer perspective uh if if we find that certain cards are more interesting duplicated we're not doing our audience uh, any favor by by uh, setting up this this uh, establishing this rule that everything's unique uh, that works against you in two ways. First of all, you don't get these interesting uh, uh, places where the cards might line up, uh, and the second thing is you're adding complexity, maybe not without where, where you might even be re uh, reducing the value. So finding what you can duplicate, how much you can duplicate. Uh, is is an interesting question uh, because every duplication uh, potentially brings this uh, extra value, uh, and it also brings simplicity, which is a you know a good thing for everybody. It, it and also I, I mean I, I should let everyone know that this is a this is a standard Garfield trick that's going back <laughs> uh, for you know at least thirty years since I've known him, and and, and probably twenty more before that, and um, it's it does it does even all the things it does directly, uh, you know, he mentioned, but it does a couple more things. Um, that way, when you have one copy of the card and it gets played, you don't necessarily know that there's not another one. So um, it changes your calculations a lot. And it also makes there be sort of a lot less, um, you know, necessarily memory involved. And then uh, by the nature of the cards, uh, you know, uh, being potentially in duplicates, uh, we'll probably get to this later on when we talk about the cards. You, 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 you're actually seeing a smaller percentage of the cards um, in each particular game, so you're not you're not, you've uh, you can't rely on what the environment's going to be like. So it, it's much more varied from game to game. Uh, uh, in a, in addition to all these other effects. So. And I also remember Marvin as the publisher had like dollar signs in his eyes and he was like, we're going to publish the Garfield mode where we have to buy the game 16 times. <laughs> yeah, so if, if you look this video uh, during the Kickstarter time, please buy 16 copies to play the Garfield mode. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. Yeah, but actually that was one of the first things that, um, that you brought to the game. It's not the only one, of course, but um, it was... Um, for me, it was a, a very uh, helpful, helpful idea, and we played around with it quite a bit. So we didn't just copy all of the cards. We we, we really um, thought heavily about which cards are, um, yeah, are, uh, make the most sense to have multiples of them in the in the base set. So um, we ended up with a with a distribution of um, sixteen cards that are in the base set as duplicates. And the 16 cards that are still still unique, and um, yeah, through playtesting, we found that this was the best, um, yeah, the best combination of let's say both worlds, um, and um, yeah, we think we think we found the sweet spot there. But um, I also still afterwards I played uh, I played um, also games where I put two or three different um, different um, sets or base sets together, um, and the game always were. were were really were really funny. So even having three copies of a card on the on the table um, didn't didn't break the game or so in any way. No. It wasn't... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Richard. Yeah, it's 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 also. I think it's kind of interesting that uh, um, while that um, intuition was uh, worked out really well, that that uh, getting duplicates, we should uh, we should work to try to get the duplicates in in the best way possible. That uh, my experience worked against me for uh, um, what the best set of uh, duplicates were. My first uh, uh, instinct was to make it so that you had, the, you know, the simpler cards were more common, and uh, the more complicated, weird cards were rarer, um, uh, because that's a formula that works well in uh, trading card games. Um, but it wasn't really as interesting as all unique cards. Um, and so then when we took a step back, we realized that, uh, that, that it wasn't a matter of, uh, you know, simplicity and, and uh, complexity. It was a matter that some cards are more interesting duplicated and other cards aren't. The, the ones that are more interesting duplicated 
are you know tend to be more complicated but that's not you know not as a rule uh, so uh, but uh, but uh, um, it, it, it 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 was serving a different function than it does in a trading card game and uh, once we uh, sort of understood what those rules were I think we got a, a very nice set yeah it's an interesting point I remember in those uh, early when we tried copying some of the more simple vanilla cards it was like uh, okay I play a 10 power creature okay I play the same 10 power <laughs> creature then I attack then I block then they both die uh, play, play became a bit more uh, formulaic um, so Actually, handpicking the cards that were interesting with themselves, it, it improved a ton. Yeah, yeah, it was a fun exercise. It's uh, very interesting. Yeah, and um, I mean, we, we also worked a lot on um, on specific cards. And what we what we tried, um, I think that was something that, that Scav, that you already um, or are very um, experienced in and brought into into the mix here is um, making sure that um, the rules don't break or at least trying to do our best possible job there. So um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about <laughs> the weird Excel sheets that, that, that went around and maybe the goal that we had in mind um, when we when we try to make the cards as yeah as easy as possible and interaction between the card between each of the cards um, yeah as as easy as possible and um, yeah try to not break the game in any way yeah um, yeah it's always been you know part of my um, what, what I'm interested in about games like this is they can get uh, so complex and and uh, and Richard. You know, with magic, it took a lot of. Uh, I, I'll be a little bit negative uh, uh, about uh, what he did. It, it took a, a lot of cleaning up his mess. <laughs> like, like he 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 had a lot of stuff going on, and um, and always the problem when you're the designer, is that you have a model in your head, and some unwritten rules and things seem like they're more clear to you than they really are because everyone else only only gets a sentence on each card they don't they don't have your internal model so um so so cleaning stuff up so that when two people sit down and play they know what happens like it's it's very 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 important to me personally i like it when everything um kind of uh works out that way and you don't have to make a guess or refer to a rule book and and and, and things like that and so um and so a lot of times you'll get interactions in these trading card games where you have timing problems. That's like the mo you can clean up everything else except the timing problems relatively easily, usually. Um, and then, so the timing problems are, are an interesting question. And, uh, and so what do you do about those? You know, one solution is you like the simplest solution the the fallback position is, you know, you say, Okay, well, whoever the active player is just gets to if things happen simultaneously, they just get to choose the order. Um, and then, you know, uh, like computer games, you sometimes they'll they'll pick a, a random order or a timestamp order or something like that that you can't really do in person. So um, that's okay, but it's actually very complicated, and things work differently at different times. And just figuring out those contradictions um, can be quite you know, quite painful. And then, and then the problem is if you heap a bunch of those simultaneous effects on top of each other, where the order really matters, then, um, you know, you get this thing of where it's almost, you know, uh, the active player almost has too, too much control and too much power as, as the number of card interactions keep building up. So there's a couple ways around this. One is to make things that happen simultaneously, um, Sort of commute with each other so it doesn't matter the order that they happen in and that's um so, so then it then it's easy then there's no problem simultaneity is, is not a problem could, Scaf, could, so, could you, you know, give an example of that so maybe the viewers are not familiar with the co commuter activity oh, oh so like um so right so you know, if if uh, if a creature is going to die and it says you know uh, whenever any creature dies it returns to the player's hand and then another one says uh, if the creature dies, it gets removed from the game instead of going to the discard pile. So that's one. Obviously, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big problem there, um, because uh, 
because what what happens does it does it get removed from the game first or does it go to the hand first and so someone has to pick and uh and, and the order matters a lot there whereas if you had if, if the two effects were something like um whatever any creature dies it gets returned to the player's hand uh and its owner you know gains one life and there's no you know being removed from the game or going to the discard pile or anything like that then it doesn't matter the order i get a life and i get a card i get a card and i get a life so um so so those things are fine to happen simultaneously that's that's not a problem and so the idea is that you want to try to kind of reduce the amount of stuff that's happening simultaneously um and um unless like i said unless it, it, it doesn't matter the order that you do and this helps you because in, even in the short run, you know, you maybe there's only one or two problems. So you say like, oh, let's just let the active player choose. OK, that's not a big deal. It happens one game in in 100 and they choose and you move along and nobody cares. But then that creates a, a strong restriction on you in the future for designing these sorts of things, because if you just keep piling on thing after thing after thing onto the death step, say, then eventually this this sort of like active player having to choose um, or a coin flip if it's a computer game or whatever, it, it it's uh, no longer viable when it happens every single turn multiple times deciding the order of two or three different things. Yeah, and I think that... So you kind of want to set your rules up ahead of time. Yeah, that was actually very eye-opening, at least for me. I don't know what it was for you, Christian, because I was going in, the, in this discussion with, okay, we have these, uh, let's say, 50 cards uh, and... Come on, they all work. They all work fine. Uh, I I played hundreds of games and, and it never really happened to me this kind of situation. Um, but thinking farther into the future is something where your experience of uh, working on so many different uh, trading card games with hundreds and thousands of different cards uh, really was eye opening for us that we that we should um, spend a bit more time in the development stage and making sure that all the different card effects. Um, work well together and i can remember that in one in one session um you said we should or someone said we should reduce the um the number of questions that player have to reduce to zero at, or close to zero while they play the game and this was also some kind of design philosophy that we had um that we always when we when we when we thought about how do these cards interact with each other um How can we make it as simple as possible so that um, people will understand without looking into the rule book and um, reading the, the FAQs? Yeah, it, it's actually even more important for Mindbug than most games because your system is so simple already. Like you really, you really can play Mindbug and not have to refer to those things. If you jump into, a, you know, you're a new player and you jump into a magic game, especially, you know, some of these constructed decks you're going to have to go to the rule book you know uh early on and lots of trading card games are so complicated so it's a matter of oh are they going to have to go to the rule book three times a session or five times a session but in mind bug it's like are they going to have to go zero times a session or two times a session and that's a that's a huge difference for players so the idea of keeping it to where they almost never have to refer to anything else is really nice that was It was really an eye-opener to start working with you. And uh, I mean, I had some ideas about these card effects, but as a player, you just think, okay, the designers, they come up with a bunch of cool card effects and then uh, maybe they see some troublesome interaction and the stuff works out. So thinking, I mean, having systems for thinking about this or, for example, thinking about, okay, this card is cool, but it will uh, restrict future design such and such, that, that was such an eye-opener. Um, in general, it was really fun to see. So, I mean, I can give a bit behind the scenes. So from Marvin and me, I think Marvin is like the guy who wants to try all sorts of crazy stuff and come up with cards. And when I, I see one of his, <laughs> and when I see one of his cards, I'm like, ooh, is that really well defined? <laughs> Or, ooh, what? I uh, know in this case, it will be messy. Uh, so I'm like holding back and being the, the, the police chief. And when we start working with you, um, Richard and Scaff, It seems you had a similar dynamic, but probably Richard is even crazier and Scaff is a lot stricter than I am. So so for me, seeing someone who who shares this vision of like being strict and it's important that the players don't have to look up stuff up while they play, it was 
it, it was an inspiration. And it's nice to have someone to, to be able to keep the other two guys in check. <laughs> <laughs> but I also have to step on, on Richard's side here again. So um, <clears throat> you, I, I can't remember the, the exact situation. Maybe someone of you can remember. But you said in, at some point in time, you said, why should only we have the fun as the game designers playing with these with these crazy card effects um, that yeah somehow they might they might break things um, but it's actually quite fun doing it um, so um, I really that 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 quote from you that why should only we as designers have fun uh, breaking the rules uh, really it really <laughs> sticked with me and I might I might refer to that uh, in later discussions with uh, with you uh, Christian or you Skev. <laughs> Right. That's a, so that's a uh, certainly a, a subtle difference uh, between um, us having the fun of uh, having crazy combinations and us having the fun of the quote fun unquote of trying to figure out how they resolve. So uh, so so yeah, I, I, I'm I'm all on board with a system which um, uh, is self consistent, uh, but I want to find all the variety that's possible in there and where it isn't there, try to figure out how to get it in. Um, and it is one of my uh, bugaboos that uh, a lot of modern game design um, is so cautious with uh, with combos and balance that, uh, that when you play it, you sort of have to, you have to be an expert before you can start understanding the subtlety of the design. And, uh, um, and I, I tend to look at the process of developing that as being a wild fun time which i want to share with people i remember yeah, so like, i remember the situation it was an endless combination yeah <laughs> it was an endless combination yes. endless co combinations are the uh the intersection between resolvability and fun so yeah yeah it's i mean and that's kind of the tricky thing because um, i mean when you are like a policeman like scaff and myself the thing you really want is to that you still have all the cool cards so you want the rules that are strict enough to avoid all this messiness but allow enough space for the crazy guys to come up with the cards that players look at them and they're like oh i can't wait to play this card um, yeah and i mean of course we made the game but i feel like we really struck a good balance there are a lot of the I... cards that i'm very excited every time i play I think so too, and um, I specifically um, can see that when I play test the game with with players that are familiar with games like Magic or other cards of that uh, of that genre, and they they pick a card and see it and they oh my god that that effect is super crazy that gives me a card advantage of I don't know two or three that's that's super super crazy, um, and they think they they smash the card on the table and say how can I lose from here and the opponent uh, says. Uh, I mind bug that, <laughs> and uh, you can see their face. Like, oh, I forgot something. Yeah, and that that is that is something that um, that I that I see quite often. Or they play it and they can they they get to keep it, and the opponent has has a has a very clean answer to it, for example, um, or plays another threat on the table, um, and they cannot utilize it completely. So these kind of situations happen, and I think especially with players who are familiar with, with with magic and other games they really need to need to reconsider their playing style so another aspect is i can see people trying to build a board and and playing creatures over creatures um when they when they actually have the opportunity to to deal damage to the opponent because they want to build a better board state um, but in mind bug oftentimes it's times it's better to um to go for a point of damage if you have the chance to, because the opponent just has three life and it's just 33% of their life total. So um, yeah, that, no, I think, I, I think I, it's I think, a different mindset that people will develop when they play um, mind bug. Yeah, I think that's going to, uh, um, it's going to, a, a lot of people are going to run into that trouble. Uh, it reminds me of uh, with Keyforge, uh, how uh, people with traditional trading card game experience ran into this uh problem of 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 mis uh, of mis misunderstanding what card advantage was because it's completely different in keyforge than it is magic and so they would do these you know it's like save cards forever to get the most advantage out of them and uh, yeah it just doesn't work that way and here 
um, almost every game you want to, uh, in, you know, it's like you have this decision is like, well, should I play something or attack with something? Playing something is building for the future. And you always want to, you know, sort of, sort of invest a little bit in the future. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, and here the wind, the horizon is, is, is much closer to your face than you expect. Yeah, I don't know if anyone said so. You only have three life points each. So just three attacks to the face and then you're done. Yeah. And yeah, but it, it, but it's not not just a matter of the percentage you're getting out of it. It's also that that uh, putting more, you know, investing more in building that board state. In some ways, that's just helping your opponent because they see where you're going to go in the future, and you have more things which are vulnerable. It gives them more things they could steal if that's exactly what they need. Um, uh, Whereas, you know, uh, uh, putting the pressure on them by attacking them and making them make the next move is, uh, is, has a lot of value. So I, I have a follow-up question. Um, so how would you say the game differs when it comes to, um, to feeling? So how does the game feel in a different way when you play it compared to one of these strategy card games? Well, uh, it's... Um, because you know so many of your cards, uh, there's um, there's uh, you can figure out a lot of things, um, which is is quite nice. It's quite different, uh, um, and certainly one of the things which I was both attracted to and worried about at the very start um, of my relationship with uh, with this game. Um, the other thing which uh, um, which we've hint you know talked a little bit about is this uh, aspect of uh, Uh, bluffing. Um, bluffing is really tricky to get right in 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 games uh, because um, well, there's, there's there's a lot of reasons why it's tricky to get right, uh, and 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 it, I mean, there's a lot of ways it can fail. Uh, there's it it can fail uh, because well, because it's not really bluffing. Uh, as Scaff said, in Magic, sometimes it feels like you're bluffing, but you're not. There is bluffing in Magic, but you, you have to be a pretty sophisticated player to be in that situation and it genuinely being bluffing. Um, uh, and, uh, um, but, but, uh, and, and you also, when you're learning to play the game, have to sort of understand what the opportunity for bluffing is. Uh, um, and, and, and this one hits you very, it hits you very fast that, uh, that when you make a play, uh, you, how important it is to, to how, how important it is to you is not clear because your opponent doesn't see the rest of your cards. And, and so your opponent deciding whether to take that from you or not with their mind bug will depend not only on what their cards are, but how important it is they think it is to you. And so very early on, you're going to hit these situations where you're playing a card which you're hoping they mind bug. And so that is kind of a, I mean, that's kind of a bluff there. You're trying to pull it. Um, and and there's a lot of reasons why you might hope, because you've got the answer in your hand is one, right? Uh, um, and, uh, but, uh, uh, uh But, uh, or, you know, you've got another threat, which is, you know, just bigger. Like if your opponent has one life left and you've got a card, which when you play it will deal one life of damage, then you're, you hope will take whatever else you put in front of them so that you can just uh, win the game. Um, so you've got this, uh, this opportunity here to present something for your opponent to take. And, uh, and that sort of, uh, that, that opens up the possibility of bluffing just with every play. Yeah, it's it's like uh, when you're playing the game, when you play a card, you're kind of supposed to have an answer to that card in your hand. Uh, so like I play a strong card, but if I plan correctly, I know if my opponent takes it, I'll be able to answer it cleanly, um, which is a very different way of thinking than other trading card games. But after you play for a while, you also realize this is also an avenue for bluffing. So like playing a really strong card that you actually have no answer to in your hand But your opponent figures, okay, if he's playing that card, he knows I have two minds box up. So he's figuring I'm going to take it and then he's going to do something. Um, so I'm going to let him have it. It's a type right. of bluffing I've also seen. Yeah. And 
it works also a little bit as a comeback mechanism in the sense that you are, when you are quite desperate, you can make these plays, but your opponent, opponent um, might in this case spend their mind box a bit aggressively just to make sure you are down, which will in the end leave you an opening. Um, so one feeling that I think is quite different um, in Mindbug is at the very end of the game. So um, when I won or lost a game, my feeling is different than compared to, let's say, Magic or so. Of course, when I win, I'm happy. When I lose, I'm not. Um, but when I win, I mo most of the time, it's um, because I had a nice, a nice strategy that worked out. Um, but even more important is the fact when I lose. So when I lose, and I experience this all the time when I play with playtesters, the first the first sentence or the first thing that I try to figure out is after they lost the game, where did I as a player made a mistake that made me lose the game? So should I have um, used the mind bug on this other card? Would have what, what would have been happened? What would have happened then? Um, they basically never say oh, you just draw that card and that card won you the game. Or would I just have drawn this card? This would have won me the game. It, it, it all really comes down to their decision-making process during the game. And that, that is something that I, that I, um, that I think is, is a bit different to, to, um, to the standard games in this area. Yeah, you, 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 you have to be probably uh, really a very sophisticated player before you can say, oh, yeah, that hand was just better. Because yes. there will be better hands and worse hands. But the fact that you can take two of your opponent's plays and they can take two of yours just makes it really difficult to figure out uh, where uh, the, the lineup between a particular uh, set of hands went wrong. And it, yeah, I have to agree. So I, I, don't, think, I don't think I've ever played without people going back and discussing, okay, okay, let's take that a few turns back. So in here, if I'd done this instead, where would that have left me? Um, somehow I think the game is well suited for that. So it's a bit chess-like with the way it moves. Um, so it's very easy to discuss alternate lines. And of course, when you're discussing afterwards, you can see the opponent's hand. But then you can see, okay, if I had acted in this way, I could, I could possibly have won. Yeah. Um, I see this... Every time I play, which is, yeah. I, I think, not so common for this genre. I think it's somehow has to do with the way the game moves. It's very easy to reverse moves and play them again or try different lines and say, here, I can do this or that. Let's check out yeah, this thing. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't think it's entirely due to it, but it is certainly partially due to the fact that you've got this very limp, like you've got 10 cards and that's all yeah. you've got. And most games are sort of more open-ended in that regard. You've got 30 and you drew 12 and then you were going to, you could have played. So you drew two more. And what might have you drawn those times? That's not this game. Usually you see all your cards during the course of play. And, Especially uh, in the end game, I guess you're not drawing anymore. So there it's, uh, I mean, you have all the information you're going to get. Um, so if you could see the opponent's hand, you could solve it like an abstract game. Yeah, that's mm. that's actually interesting because I think that's also a, a very good point that speaks for the game. Most of the games have some kind of climax and it gets uh, the tension grows and grows during the game because you have only 10 cards left. So as Richard mentioned, you see in most of the games, you see um, all of your cards or at least most of your cards. Um, and bots will sometimes be a bit more crowded, sometimes not, but creatures will trade. Um, so you will play threats and they will they will go away because they will be dealt with and so on. And in the end, um, it, 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 it feels like the climax is, is reached and decisions are becoming more and more, I don't want to say brutal, but um, if you make a, a wrong decision in the end game, you, prob you probably lose. So they're becoming very meaningful in the, in the end of the game um, because there's so much um, known information. On the, on the table and that's um, actually kind of interesting that that you have this growing climax in this game I think so but we ran into another problem when you um, when you both uh, joined Richard and Skeff because um, in the beginning um, Christian and I we were just playing our dueling card game as a one-on-one -on -one, um, as a one-on-one -on -one, uh, game 
Um, and that was fine. But since we were four, four designers now, we needed to find a way to play with four people as a, four people <laughs> as well. And then that uh, dives a little bit into or transitions a little bit into the topic of um, future design space for the game. Because um, we, of course, tried different, um, different multiplayer versions of the game as well. And um, I initially came up with uh, the very boring um, standard approach. Let's say, okay, let's let's play um, two head two headed giant. So uh, two people sitting ne next to each other um, as a team, talking about their strategy, and um, um, yeah, acting as let's say one body with two with two heads. But um, then you came up with, with with your idea, Richard, and I think that was. Uh, one of the best additions that you put to the game um, and said, I, I think the, the, the two and two mode should be, uh, should be a bit different. So people should not sit, the team should not sit next to each other. They, did, they, sh they should sit across um, to each other and they should probably not talk to each other. Um, and um, what this did to the game is um, these kind of mind games that were already there in the one-on-one -on -one mode, <coughs> they, they kind of doubled with the with a two on two mode because um you did not only have to anticipate what your opponent does you also have to take into co into co consideration what your what your ally might 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 do and how the 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 current board state might be different for uh for for him or her so um i think the the two on two mode that we tested is is pretty 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 good and very different to other um other games of that genre that i've seen Yeah, no, it was a lot of fun to play around with that. Uh, certainly my my uh, first inclination with any uh, two-player game is to uh, get a get a team version of it. Because uh, yeah, usually it's pretty straightforward. There's a lot of fun to be had. Uh, um, sorry, you mean with every one player? Uh, one... Oh, sorry, no, never mind. <laughs> Two-player game, one the math works out. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> the map works out. The one, one plus one is yeah, two. Yeah. Um, okay, I get it now. <laughs> um, uh, and what my I, my ideals in uh, in getting that uh, team game to be its best is is that the partners in the game uh, have to um, communicate through their play. Uh, <laughs> And uh, and and I think you get into situations there where uh, where it's very satisfying when when you can figure out what your partner uh, is trying to do, what their weaknesses are, what their strengths are, um, and and where you're making plays that are uh, um, communicating to your partner those things about your hand and your position, uh, and then. Uh, 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 And, and then you get into a, a really uh, a, a, an area which I really like. And, and, and what I really want to avoid with team games is uh, any notion that uh, one person can play both positions. Um, and this is very common in cooperative games, uh, and a lot of people don't have any uh, uh, problem with it. But, uh, but I think uh, in, in general, the, the games are just stronger if, uh, if communication is... Uh, a part of that game experience. Uh, well, and, oh, go ahead. A lot of the game will also tell you to be like, okay, you can uh, communicate, but in kind of vague terms, you can't <laughs> say uh, numbers. You have to say, I play a big creature, I play <laughs> a small creature. Um, and oh, yeah. I think this was something where we were on the same page that uh, we're not really into that sort of thing. No, no, and 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 also it's fine. You know, the first time you sit down to any cooperative game, any amount of co-op communication is fine. Just to sort of figure your way around. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, but uh, but once you once you understand the system, I think it just becomes a lot more interesting when uh, when it's uh, yeah communication through play. Yeah, actually, it was one of the things that attracted me immediately to Mindbug is the system is so simple and uh, and it plays so quickly that the I mean the major stumbling block to you know two v two games is like when you try to make it a team game um, if it's if it's complex it can become more complex it can be very difficult to keep track of the board state 
And also, I think even worse is that um, the time to play can get out of control. And uh, there's many, many um, trading card games that I love, and I love playing the team game version, but they're hour long games or 45 minute long games or whatever. And so Mindbug um, basically immediately solves both those problems. So you, you kind of knew that um, if we didn't come up with a good team game version, it was essentially our fault <laughs> because all the, all the, the bones were strong, you know, for that sort of thing. And, uh, and actually it's even true of, you know, the potential for it to be, um, a co-op game is the, uh, you know, like a solo, uh, a, either a solo game, a solitaire game or a co-op solitaire game, um, it is certainly there as well for the exact same reason. Um, the, the rules are relatively simple. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think all that's great. The other awesome thing about Mindbug, which is completely separate from its simplicity and its time to play, which also makes it good for the team game is actually the Mindbug. So, it's very common in team games where you don't really have to pay that much attention to what's going on, depending upon how you're lining up, you know, the other person, if it's playing against your partner or et cetera. But here, um, because you can mind bug things, it's like, I mean, every single move that every single person makes, um, you're on the edge of your seat. So it's good. Yeah, it was interesting for me working with you guys, because I can hear you're really into team games and I'm the exact opposite so for every you know one-on-one -on -one dueling game that claims it has a team mode i'm like no way i don't even want to touch it um so here being forced to actually play a team mode i i ended up having a lot of fun so either maybe i'm just too strict on the other ones and i have to be more, more open to it um or maybe it's what I'm choosing to believe is that it only works for mind good bug but it's still better for all other games <laughs> But it, but in all seriousness, we I think it was some of our most uh, fun sessions was was playing at, as a team, and you still had I mean the way you made decisions, thinking strategically about stuff, all that was was conserved. Um, so I was really impressed with it. Um, so is it correctly remembered, Richard? Were you influenced from traditional card games for 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 the team version? Yeah. Uh um, I, I don't know. I, I, it, 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 there was nothing, certainly nothing sophisticated uh, about it. Uh, um, it. So I think I, I think I just uh, copy pasted, uh, and, and, and we haven't nailed down exactly what the rules are in that regard. But copy pasted the 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 the, um, the rules that I, I thought would work best. Uh, um, so yeah, it was straightforward. And and I think like one of the things that uh, that, that that I think could be useful in the version we played, for example, it's nice if uh, there's some mechanism within play for you to pass cards to your opponent or to your partner. Um, and uh, and we talked about different ways you could do that within the game, And I, uh, but we, we haven't actually gone through and figured out whether that would make the game better or how exactly it would be done. But, uh, but that's often a lot of fun is if, if you can get that level of communication in there as well but what we had was yeah what was was yeah just very straightforward we we played around also with uh playing next to each other but not being allowed to communicate um because oftentimes oftentimes i i like the texture that gives to the game in that different players will have different roles like the person who plays first of a pair has naturally a different uh um a different set of attributes than the person who plays second but uh, um, playing side by side does not support as well this idea that uh, you should communicate through your card play because you can make that a rule. But if you're sitting next to the person, it's going to you know, it's like it's so easy to look at their hand that sitting opposite is just easier to, to, to make that work the way we want it. Yeah. So as you can as you can see, we definitely have design space where we want to uh, put much more work into into that um, as I think four player um, version is definitely something we want to um, want to play more and work more um, to, to narrow down the rules I think we are pretty close but we want to test a few more things um, Scav you already mentioned um, that you would like to um, like to um, 
to explore the opportunity of having some kind of, of solo mode or cooperative, cooperative mode. And um, yeah, what, what else, um, what, what else um, is, um, is the design space that you would like to dive into in the future? Is there something else that you are really keen on, um, uh, on working on for Mindbug? I mean, one thing at a time, right? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I'm 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 interested in that. I'm I'm very interested in the how 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 hard can you push an environment to make it play differently? I mean, I think you know we've played around a little bit with that, and it, it's very interesting. And I don't think we've you know nearly gotten to the limits. Of that, so. so like we have a base set that plays a certain way and has a certain dynamic. So if we make a completely different set, uh, like you said, if we go with mostly uh, small big creatures or a lot of uh, hunters or something like this, can we get a totally different feel that way? Right. That would certainly be some right. cool uh, boundaries to push. I think we've discussed some fun stuff that we play around with. Also. Uh, like having uh, tokens as a science space. So until now, we've limited ourselves to just cards, which you can do a ton of cool things with. With but having being able to, to place tokens on stuff to buff it or to poison it or to do all kinds of things, it seems there's also a lot of fun stuff to play with there. Yeah, yeah there's a huge amount of things you can do uh, just by adding uh, different states to cards, which can be enabled by tokens. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. That's something that I'm also very interested in. So um, let's let's come to let's come to 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 an end. Um, but before before we leave, I would like to know what kind of what's your favorite what's your favorite card of um, of the base set. So who wants to go first? I will go first. Okay. So my favorite card. It's called. Uh, it has the longest name in the set. It's called the. <laughs> Uh, Shaggy Crab Dog Mummy Puss. Yeah, uh, that's my favorite card name. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a creature which is a mix of a whole bunch of different things. Uh, and the way its card effect works, works is that um, whichever keywords the opponent has, it will copy those. So if the opponent has a hunter in play, it will also have the hunter trait. And if the opponent has a sneaky creature, it will also be sneaky. Um, so the way so I've seen this card so many times in playtests do really interesting stuff, um, such as the opponent might suddenly want to just attack and die with a creature just to lose that creature um, because it was their sneaky creature mm -hmm. and that will remove sneaky from you, but yeah. you don't want that to happen, so you'll actually take the hit to keep being sneaky. Um, <laughs> interactions like this, so it makes it makes people play in a different way, which is which is cool. And also like the flavor of just a whole bunch of weird different things being <laughs> Yeah, I think I think my favorite card is uh, uh, what's what's the one that uh, makes it so uh, your come into play effects don't work. Um, it's the death some weaver. Sort of ooze. Death, death weaver. Then yeah, it, it was it, the it, ooze during the design phase. Uh, it's now the death weaver. Yeah, yeah. I, I I like that one because so so it was little and when you played it, uh, it didn't do anything. But uh, but while in play, um, nobody's or was it just your opponents? Your opponent, just your opponents. Your opponent. uh, 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 come into play effects didn't work, and so the reason I, I liked it was because uh, it it always uh, I found it I found its play always really interesting in that uh, um, throwing it out there early. You don't you don't really know how it's going to affect your opponent, um, and uh, um, and they don't know how it's going to affect you either. So so uh, uh, I find that that sort of sets you up for really uh, natural bluffs. Like it could actually be much worse for me than than uh, than it seems uh, because uh, because uh, I really want to uh, I really don't want my opponent to turn off my uh, my comes into play effects. Uh, but the fact that I threw out there, you know, makes it seem like uh, th they're going to be thinking, oh, well, he probably doesn't have any or they're not very important or he can take care of it. Um, um, and uh, uh, yeah, turning turning off those effects uh, can sit there in the background for a while and then just suddenly change the whole texture towards the back end of the game. Anyway, I think it, uh, it it changes the way people play in a in a pretty interesting way. 
Yeah, and, and also you don't like the people you're playing against to have fun. <laughs> you, like, you like to crush their spirit. That's part of no, it. No, 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 that's, 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 that's part of it. That's what you would do because you would save it until they couldn't mind bug you. I like to throw it out there so they can <laughs> mind bug it. Uh, and then, then I like them to, to, yeah, to, to, to regret that decision when they choose not to or choose to. Yeah, that's right. It always comes down to them not having fun in the short run or in the long <laughs> run. Just, cru just crushing them mentally. Um, so my favorite card is, uh, is um, Killer Bees. And it's because when it comes into play, it does a direct damage to the opponent. And there's really n almost none of that in the entire game. And the reason I like that card is not even so much when I have it or when my opponent has it. Uh, it's that its existence in the environment changes the play so much. So just because you know that thing is out there, it's, um, it, it's incredible how much it changes your decisions. Um, because you, you can't go down to one life safely. And uh, unless you've got that uh, ooze in play, mind, unless you have the ooze in play, <laughs> then they can't. Or, uh, uh, or unless you have a mind bug, but yeah. then you have to reserve your mind bug for that. So, um, so a lot of interesting things come out, you know, bluffing wise uh, with mind bugs, where you know they'll flop down a creature where you're like, oh, if I mind bug that, I basically win. Oh, unless they have killer B as their next play and you know because I'm at one life and so I, I really like those cards which um, radically change your decisions even when they aren't in play so. yeah I think that's also a very good card and a good choice so my my favorite well, it's, it's also a really good card <laughs> yeah. my yeah. my um, my choice goes to the it has to go to the lone yeti uh, because it's a card that's there from the very beginning it changed slightly during the development stage um, but what it does is it's a pretty unimpressive power five creature that is tough that means it has basically two life but um, it i think if you have it as a power five creature it basically don't wins you the game um, but it says uh, when when it's the only creature that you have in play it gets plus five power and becomes frenzy so then it's a real it's a real threat um and what i love about this card game uh, this this card is it it was eye opening for me back then when i when i played with that card for the first time because it showed me that each card needs to be evaluated um both for you and for the opponent it's it's very often this card is asymmetrical on the board because it means if i play this into a board where my opponent has already a creature on the table on on, on their side um, if they mind bug the Yeti, it will enter their battlefield as a power five creature. But if they don't mind bug it, and I don't have a creature yet, it, it is the main threat for on, on my side of the table. It's a power 10, frenzy, tough creature that will dominate the board. So um, it really is interesting um, to see that it has a very different value to people in different in different situations. Um, but it's also good in the in the in the end game because you can if it, if it sits on the table it's not alone you can you can you can uh, can have it uh, sit there and throw away your other creatures you can you can attack because uh, if if they somehow die um, you know that you have this big power frenzy creature in the back that yeah will get frenzy at the end of the game. I think the very first time we played this was the first card uh, that came into play. Maybe um, it was yes. I remember and already there we started understanding like I think I played it and then you stole it from me and then I played another really strong card and you wanted to steal that as well but then you yet it would stop working. Yeah. That that's it's kind of that's the typical kind of interaction that um that you will have in mind in mindbug when you play the game. So um I hope a lot of people will play the game in the future and giving us the um the chance to to keep working on the game and um yeah, exploring new design space because i think there is a lot of it so thank you very much uh christian richard and scaff for being um yeah guests on the nerd lab podcast and being on that uh, mind bug journey together with me and uh, yeah the mind bug over there it's a pleasure <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's great yeah marvin okay. I, I think you should 
you should show the mind bug. It just looks like some random octopus in the background. You can yeah, okay. show it on the camera that it's actually a mind bug. Okay, I can do though. Give me a second. <laughs> it's actually something my wife made for me. Um, and it is not a random octopus. It just has one eye and it says mind bug on the side. And if you if you don't uh, if you if you um, if you don't doesn't it go on your head? Yeah, it goes <laughs> on my head. And now and now what it typically does it it it, it controls the mind of the, the person it sits on and it says buy mind bug buy the mind bug game. <laughs> so it controls the mind of uh, of people and maybe that's uh, maybe uh, it is the reason that you all of uh, all of you are are here and joined me on this journey. I don't know. <laughs> okay then thank you very much um to all of you and um also thank you for the listeners who um joined us on this uh yeah uh this video and this explanation of of mindbug and the design journey so um yeah until next week keep shooting for the moon and not like a boss goodbye everyone bye bye, bye. bye.